Neo Langto, welcome to the realignment. Thank you for having me on. It's interesting. Sometimes there are history books that hit at the complete wrong moment. Other times there are books that come a little early, but then history, the narrative, the broader conversation hits the perfect time. So as I understand it, your book, The Approaching Storm, Roosevelt, Wilson, Adams, and their Clash Over America's Future came out in November. So it's we're a little later in the book tour, but I was glad you reached out because I was thinking a lot about your book in terms of this idea of various figures in American political history thinking through a big conflict in Europe and how that can determine the fate of their domestic policy programs, how that could determine the future of their actual ideological movement, and then just the broader idea there. So I'll ask you this. We're not exactly in the, you know, 100-year anniversary of World War I. We're not in the 100-year anniversary of the U.S. intervening in Europe in 1917. So what made you write this book for release last November then? Well, I wish the book had come out right now, as we just talked about. I think it would have gotten a little more traction. Um, but I have been asked a lot about the Ukraine par par uh, parallel with World War I. Um, it was a book that came to me as far as I was reading an earlier series of book by the journalist Mark Sullivan. He was a, uh, a very big, big shot in the early 1900s. He wrote for a lot of publications and knew everyone and talked to everyone. And he had done a series of books about his own times called Our Times, it was a six volume series. And I happened to pick up a couple of the books on World War I and started reading them. And I realized there was so much about World War I I didn't know and that there was a definite story to be told. And I also came to realize that this war is so important as far as the world is concerned, and America's role, I think, has been uh, overlooked. Um, I came to believe that America's role actually had a huge impact on the 20th century, because if we hadn't gotten involved, it's possible that the outcome of World War I would have been very diff different than it turned out to be. And of course, the outcome of World War I sets the stage for World War II and the rest of the 20th century. So I think it's a really important, overlooked issue and story in American history. And I thought the best way to tell it was through these three individuals who were all tied together, these three great progressives of the time, uh, Woodrow Wilson, the president, his great rival, Theodore Roosevelt, and probably the least of the three, as far as their, how well known they are today, uh, the social worker, Jane Addams of Chicago. It's funny how this works. I remember Jane Addams because there is a AP US history question about whole house. Uh, so I think a lot of us will just have this vague little fact that will go there, but this is really great. I want to start just on World War One, a huge topic of conversation when it's come to Ukraine. Most of the debate in terms of popular culture comes down to World War II imagery. So Putin, is he Hitler? Is he Stalin? Are folks who negotiate with Putin, are they Winston Churchill? Are they Neville Chamberlain? Do you want to be an appeaser? Do you not want to be an appeaser? There are big questions that are raised by World War II that I think are really relevant and we should get into later. But let's just start by contextualize what's happening in the sense of World War I, if, if you can do that. Um, in, this, in the terms of the questions that folks, especially in the American political system, are having to think through this crisis. One of the, the parallels I particularly have seen uh, is the invasion of Belgium in 1914. I mean, World War I breaks out in the summer of 1914, and very early on, the Germans go through Belgium uh, to get to France. And it was, it was an incredibly brutal invasion. It was shocking to the American public. And it was the same story what we're seeing now of a sovereign nation being invaded and violated by a, a stronger power. Um, and like today, the United States and its leaders had to, had to make decisions of how do we respond to this? What do we do? Does this affect our national security? Are we responsible for helping uh, nations that are not as strong as us when they are violated? And I think some of the same questions that were asked in 1914 uh, by, by the American public and its leaders are being asked today. What is our responsibility today to, the, to, to Ukraine? Uh, what should we be doing? Should we be committing troops? Uh, is, it, is it none of our business? So all of these things are, I think, coming home today in the 21st century were originally hashed out in 1914. And ironically, a Democratic president in both cases, Joe Biden today and Woodrow Wilson in 1914. And in some ways, both of them are facing the same challenges as, as you mentioned, uh, 
Is their own agenda, their domestic agenda going to be disrupted by what's going on internationally? And is it going to hold the fate of their presidency if things go wrong? Is it going to hold the fate of their party if things go wrong? So that's what I find particularly interesting as far as the parallels between 1914 and 2022. Another thing that's interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, the other parallel between Belgium and Ukraine is just the idea of neutrality. So both are countries that aren't technically part of either big alliance system or alliance system in the sense of the central powers, then there's obviously the allies or the entente. Um, And in the case of the 21st century, you have Ukraine, which is not a NATO country. They lean towards the West. I think you could argue that Belgium leaned towards France as opposed to leaning towards Germany. But this idea of alliances is also just seems to be a really relevant topic that mattered a little less in the World War II context, but really seemed to be the defining issue in 1914. Would you, would you agree with that? I would agree. I think that's a really good point. I think Belgium was seen as being not quite a part of either of these alliances, as you said, probably lean more towards, towards uh, the French at that time. Um, and again, being caught up in this in this this sort of brutal situation between these two superpower alliances, and they're in the middle, caught in the middle here, and and are are as I said, violated. It was it was, and Americans were absolutely shocked by the brutality of the of the uh, Belgian invasion in 1914. There was a great deal of there was a groundswell of of charity, which we're seeing here in the United States right now, as far as for the for uh, you know, Ukrainians. And there were also Americans who, who went over to serve in 1914 uh, to, to fight against the Germans. Again, we're seeing, I was reading the other day, we're seeing Americans who are trying to enlist us to, to assist the Ukrainians right now. So it, it is a similar situation as far as, and the question of course is going to be, what does it mean? Is it going to spiral into something much larger? Uh, and, and that was a concern even in 1914. And for Woodrow Wilson, his fear was that America was going to be sucked into what was going on uh, in Europe at the time. And that's going to be his effort to keep us out for a few years, although he does have a desire for us to play a role in the peace process. He's not neutral for neutrality's sake. He's neutral because he believes that if we kind of stand apart, we will be able to, in a position to do something to bring the peace to the combatants and also help to remake the post-war world. So that's a good pivot into just introducing the three characters here, probably go by order of Wilson, Roosevelt, and then Jane Addams. So Wilson's a very interesting figure and a controversial figure. You know, we don't hear much about Wilson as much today. And when we do hear about him, it's usually for his racial views, which is obviously a a, a huge negative part in his legacy. Um, I do touch on that a little bit in the book. Uh, There's some issues with Wilson where... uh, um, he's visited by the African American editor William Monroe Trotter in the fall of 1914, and he has a very charged discussion and argument with Trotter because Trotter tries to come see him and talk about the segregation that's going on in the federal government. And the interesting thing is the whole conversation was recorded by a stenographer, so you can read the whole back and forth between these two men. And and Trotter tries to educate Wilson. You know, it's like you're enforcing segregation. Segregation is, is, is telling us that we're not equal. We are not the brothers. We're not the equal to our brothers. And Wilson just can't get it. He just does not grasp that. Um, and I always say, I, I, Wilson was someone who just never could get out of his, his, his Civil War mindset. He grew up in the South uh, in Virginia. And his, he, he, his second wife was also, a, uh, was also from the South and she had similar views. So he was someone who just that was his old fashioned viewpoint as far as race was concerned. So when we hear about Woodrow Wilson today, we tend to forget some of the good things he did. He was a progressive. He was uh, you know, on, on the forefront of a lot of positive developments in the, in the first part of the 20th century. He was certainly important as an internationalist and in pushing for the League of Nations. Um, when the war starts in 1914, he'd been in office for two years. Um, he was not someone who was a lifelong politico. He was someone who had been president of, of uh, of Princeton. He had been an academic and suddenly he got pushed into democratic politics, got elected governor of New, New Jersey. From there, he jumps into the White House. It was a pretty, pretty shocking uh, political jump. But he was someone who thought he was more interested in domestic policy and he found himself suddenly dealing with international relations in this war, this, this giant war that was unfolding. And what's also very difficult for Wilson is that his wife is dying as the war begins, his first wife. His first wife, Ellen, is, is dying. And Wilson almost pretty much has a breakdown after the death of his wife when this happens. So that's Wilson when the war begins. But he does believe one thing, that America should remain neutral with the hope of 
being able to assist the warring powers in bringing peace in the future. A um, quick thing, I want to I want to just interject with the parallels here that come to mind when you talk about the history. This this is, when we're talking about Wilson and race, the part that is very relevant to today is this idea of hypocrisy. So if you think of the way the British would describe World War I, they called this the Great War for Civilization. You're referring to the Germans as Huns for how barbarously they treated the, the Belgians and all sorts of various, just like really, really honestly terrible acts. The Kaiser um, and his, his family say so many, really just really terrible things. Like the Hun, the Hun reference actually comes from the, the Germans themselves. So you have this framing of the, the civilized West against the, the, the barbarous Germans. Yet, once again, Woodrow Wilson is um, resegregating the federal government. Um, the Jim Crow South is obviously, the Ku Klux Klan is coming back. Um, the British are maintaining an empire where they are effectively you know, in, enslaving hundreds of millions of people, especially in India. How, so when it comes to today, you often see a lot of rhetoric about, oh, you know, we're saying that the West is in the right when it comes to Ukraine, but look what's happening in Yemen, look what happened in Iraq, look what happened in Afghanistan. So how do you think about this idea of just hypocrisy when it comes to determining whether we should be on any one side or the other? Well, that's an interesting point. And actually uh, in the book, I have a few references to that where people did call out Wilson and the Wilson administration about this saying like, you know, you, you speak of all these good things you're going to do for Europe and the rest of the world, but on the other hand, you're ignoring what's going on as far as lynching in the United States in the 20th, in the 20th century. Uh, you know, is this only about, you know, is, you know you're, you're overlooking the plight of 10% of the country uh, right now. So there, there were people who tried to push that issue. And I think of the three discussed in this book, Jane Addams was the most uh, cutting edge as far as her racial views. It was, it was, quite troubled with what was going on as far as race in this country. On the, on the other hand, you know, she was a pragmatist in that she felt Wilson, the good things Wilson was doing, she could overlook some of the bad things he was doing as far as race was concerned, just like she worked with Theodore Roosevelt, who, you know, in some ways could be a militarist and Adams was a pacifist, but she saw some of the good things and the progressive things Roosevelt was doing. So they, they're all complex individuals. They all have different sides to them. That's why I think it's always good to look at historical figures, not through this good, good or bad, but there's a little good bit of good of them, a little bit of bad in them. Um, and I think Wilson, he, he occasionally could show some, some advanced views towards race. I think there, you know, he's often credited, for example, as being uh, approving the uh, birth of a nation, which is not necessarily true, as I talked about in the book. Can you explain what birth of a nation was? Yeah, birth of a nation was, was one of the first blockbuster feature length films in American history. It was, it was uh, directed by D.W. Griffith. Uh, Americans were crazy over this movie. It was, it was a pioneering, the, the technology was unbelievable for the time and the special effects were unbelievable. And it's the sweeping story of reconstruction after the civil war. Now, it's also a terribly racist view of American history told in a, in a very extreme and incendiary fashion. Um, and there, it was not totally accepted by the American public. There was, it was popular, but, but there were some people who were very concerned about it. Um, Adams went to see it and she was appalled and she spoke out against it. And she said, this just shows how Hollywood, which not quite being called Hollywood, but she said the film industry manipulates the public and, and people can be shown anything, which is true today with movies. Movies are often so inaccurate. And that was true a hundred years ago. Um, on the other hand, Wilson and New D.W. Grip, New, New Thomas Dixon, the book was, the, the movie was based on Thomas Dixon's novels, racist novels. And Dixon said, can I show it in the White House? And Wilson said, sure, go ahead. Showed it in the White House. Um, later on, people used to say, well, Wilson approved of this movie. He never actually approved of it. He later distanced himself, said, I just showed it. I didn't say anything about it. However, Wilson probably wouldn't have disagreed with the content of that movie because the depiction of African-Americans and the depiction of Reconstruction in that film uh, would have mirrored his own particular views on race at the times, particularly the idea that Reconstruction was a terrible thing, that African Americans were not ready for freedom and shouldn't have been allowed to vote, that type of thing. So that's uh, an interesting part of the story as far as, as far as the film is concerned and sort of racial beliefs are concerned. I think Roosevelt was, was a bit better with race. 
uh, but neither of them in, from a 21st century standpoint would be, their views would be acceptable today. I think Adams, as I said, was far ahead of her time. She was involved with the NAACP when it, when it took some courage to be involved with the NAACP, it was a brand new organization. So she was on the forefront of racial issues and racial concerns. Um, as I said, she was quite unhappy about Birth of a Nation. And, and she took some criticism too in 1916 when she supported Wilson for president. There's a, there's a letter uh, which I excerpted in, in my book where an African-American woman wrote to the, I think it was the Chicago Tribune saying, you know, I'm very, very disappointed that Miss Adams and other social workers are supporting uh, the Democratic Party, which is the party of racism and segregation. Um, so, you know, how can you, 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 you be hip, hip, you're being somewhat uh, hypocritical to support Wilson on that end um, when he's, you know, when he, he's obviously so, so, uh, retrograde in his racial views. On the other hand, Adams would say, well, he's good with other issues. He's good with the peace issue. So political, political uh, what's convenient, I think, is what she did. Um, but as I said, these, the two, two men in this, of, these, of this trio were fairly behind and backward as far as race was concerned. So I think folks are probably going to know the most about Theodore Roosevelt. So we have to do a little less biography there and more so. This is after he has served effectively two terms. He's recently lost his third party attempt after he's frozen out of the Republican Party. He brings down um, his former um, vice president um, with him. At this point, what explains his position of intervention? Well, Roosevelt, when the war begins, is in a tough spot. As you mentioned, he had, he had he had left the Republican Party, tried to set up his breakaway party, the Progressive Party in 1912, did well. Uh, and he did have a hope that this Progressive Party was gonna turn into what the Republican Party had turned into 60 years earlier. You know, a breakaway party becomes the second of the, of the, of the two parties in the two party system. Unfortunately, they did not. They did not grow beyond what they did in 1912 and they started to decline. So he was finding himself sort of at, at a loss uh, he also was disgusted by Woodrow Wilson. He, he, he hated this man. He couldn't stand him. And he particularly couldn't stand that Wilson was president at a time when this global catastrophe, I mean, Roosevelt wanted to be in the White House so bad. I mean, I think anyone who was in the White House would have faced the ire of Theodore Roosevelt at this time because he wanted to be president at this time while this, this important crisis was unfolding. But I think Roosevelt did have some fairly essential core ideas about the war and that particularly that the United States has responsibilities. If we're, if we're to be a great power, we have to be in a position to do something with our power and to act when other countries are violated. You know, Belgium has been violated. The United States can't stand by and watch. If we, are, if we mean anything as a nation, we have to do something. And if we have to do something, we have to have the military might to do something. And we don't have that. This was Roosevelt's great cause as well, because our, our army was really small at the beginning of World War I. Actually, it was small uh, in the late 30s. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, I think, learned from Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson in that he began to prepare the US military before we got involved in World War II. Um, but in 1914, our army was 100,000 men, roughly. It was, it was very, very small. And Roosevelt's going to get behind this issue of preparedness. So if, if we can, we need, if we need to if we can accomplish anything in the world, we have to have the punch behind it. We have to have the military might to do something. And he felt that Wilson was not moving fast enough in that direction, that Wilson was not doing enough to strengthen our, our defenses, and that in some future date, the, the Germans and the Japanese might get together. It's funny that Roosevelt was saying this in 1915, and it did happen 25 years later, but he was already envisioning at some point uh, we could be menaced by these two powers. So. I think in some ways he took a more realistic view than Wilson. Wilson had this idea, we're gonna, we're gonna go in there and we're gonna, we're gonna help bring peace to these warring combatants. And Roosevelt basically said, they're not gonna let the Americans do anything unless we fight in this war. You, you think two, con two sides that have bloodied each other and spent billions of dollars and millions of men killed are gonna come to the United States and say, help us bring about peace. The answer is no, we're gonna have to get involved in this war at some point or do more as far as uh, our contribution for them to listen to us. And actually Wilson will find that out at Versailles in 1919 when the war is over. I think Wilson would have had more oomph at the peace conference if America had done more of the fighting. And if the war had gone on a little bit longer, World War I, if it had gone on into 1919, we would have had 
I think even another million troops, American troops would have been uh, in Europe. And I think Wilson would have had more to show, could, could have pointed to the American involvement and contribution. And I think he would have gotten a little bit more of what he wanted at Versailles than he did. And let's get into, because I want to I get into the progressive domestic side here, because that's what I'm super interested in. But please explain who was Jane Adams beyond my AP bragging, which was slightly unnecessary. Um, and just like, who was she? And then what's her actual position when it comes to this debate? Jane Adams has been so forgotten today, and she she really shouldn't. I'm, I'm actually impressed you know her from your AP class. So that's, uh, I've been on other programs where people just, they, they've never heard of her before. And I always say she, she was probably in the early 20th century, one of the most famous women in America, uh, maybe second to Helen Keller is, my, is, is, is what I usually say. And she was also globally known and she had, she had made her, her name first establishing Hull House, uh, which was a, a settlement house in Chicago, which you know, ministered and, and, and assisted the poor uh, and, and the immigrants in Chicago, sort of a social service agency. So that, that put her name on the map. But then from there, she became just a, a, a liberal, a champion liberal and reformer who was involved in not just Chicago, but soon in the United States. And she was just in every kind of cause. I mentioned civil rights she was part of. She was involved in all kinds of other reforms, uh, children. Um, suffrage was one of her major, major issues, women's suffrage. And then also uh, the issue of pacifism. That was another one of her, her, her core beliefs. So she was someone who was well known to the American public and was accepted by the American public when she was doing things that were seen as acceptable for a woman, social work type things, social services. But when she gets into more controversial issues like foreign policy and issues like peace, uh, the American public will turn on her. And you see that in my book, as the war goes on, she starts getting more and more backlash from the public and it's a real vicious commentary from the press at the time, basically getting, you know, calling her, you know, a crack brained old, 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 uh, old maid who knows nothing and how dare she stick her nose in foreign affairs because she's going to be on the forefront of this, of this war. Um, she and her followers believe that it's not so much that they, the side should stop fighting, but there should be a way to get them to talk, to stop fighting. It's, she's not necessarily a it's not about nonviolence necessarily for her. It's more about this is the 20th century. We should be able to solve these crises through some means other than shooting each other up and killing each other. So she's gonna push for the United States to basically throw all of its might and power into some way of getting the two sides to stop fighting. Uh, one of the things she's very interested in is, is some kind of conference of the neutral powers getting together as a first step and then using that as sort of a bridge to a larger peace conference, which will get them talking. And she has a lot of support for that. Um, and she's going to push Wilson over and over between 1914 and 17 to do something like that. And Wilson will pay a lot of lip service to her because he knows how important she is politically. Um, but he will constantly tell her it's not the time, it's not the time, it's not the time. You know, we, we can't do it. If we do it now prematurely, it'll, it'll blow up in our face. He will eventually make his own peace move very, very late in 1916, which at that time was too late. Uh, but that's what Adams is trying to do throughout this period is to get her message out and try to get the American people on her side. And she will travel to Europe at one point and she will actually meet with the heads of state of both sides. So she'll go to Germany and she'll talk to the prime, the, prime the, uh, the chancellor and she'll go to England, talk to the prime minister. I mean, it's quite amazing. It's citizen diplomacy before that word really existed. So here's a big question. Like you said, all three of these figures mm -hmm. are progressives. And if you bracket out Theodore Roosevelt, he represents, and this is once again, the wider context of why this episode and book really matters. He represents the interventionist instinct in American foreign policy history. Then you have Wilson. He represents this urge to be neutral, not naive, not, not powerless, but neutral. When you have two clashing titans, why necessarily jump in the middle of them when there's complications on both sides? And then Jane Adams has this um, pacifistic instinct, this instinct that once again, you know, we're not an empire, we're a republic, we don't necessarily, and this isn't exactly her wording, but this is how the instinct is often, you know, phrase that we, the whole benefit of living in a, living in a remove in terms of the um, North American continent is that you can hold this type of position. Here's what I'm curious about. 
and this applies to today too then, what determines why specific views of American domestic policy, whether those views hold the positions I just outlined. So for example, it's kind of interesting that the position of universal health care and increased social spending tends to line up with, or at least traditionally is lined up with less intervention. But actually that's not even true because during the Vietnam War, right? Like, you know, Lyndon Johnson, he is, in, he's a cold, he, JFK, they are, they are cold warriors. They are deeply engaging in the world in a very aggressive way. At the same time, they are promoting vast expansions to the welfare state. So just within these, so what within this debate within progressivism, how does, is there a link between how you see America as a social state and the way you see America's role in the world? Well, one thing you do see at this time is that there is no hard and fixed progressives having a particular view as far as America's intervention in the war, because there were some progressives who sided with Roosevelt. They thought Roosevelt's view was right, that we should be more interventionist. Um, then there were other progressives who were more of the Jane Addams stripe, who felt that uh, this was not our war, this was not our place, this was damaging to the entire reform atmosphere, getting involved, it's going to make us a militarist nation. Uh, so it, it's, it's, I think it's probably more telling in this period to look at parts of the country where people were from. I think the East Coast was particularly more fav in favor of some sort of intervention or some sort of involvement, I think because the ties to Europe were stronger on the East Coast and even the ethnic ties, a lot of people on the East Coast had at that time had, had British uh, or perhaps even French uh, backgrounds. When you start getting to the Midwest then you're finding people who are farther and farther away from Europe, don't get it, don't see what the point is, don't see their connection. And you have to realize a lot of the, the touchy issues which aren't gonna get us involved in World War I involve travel. Uh, to Europe involved uh, German submarines attacking ships and Americans getting caught in the crossfire. But many Americans never took a ship across the ocean in their lives. They're saying, we're going to go to war over this issue of a few Americans getting killed because they're traveling on ships like the Lusitania. This seems like a great waste of our time. We're not really threatened. So I think the strongest impulse was not necessarily party affiliation or uh, at the time or, or, or uh, orientation as far as politically, but I think probably I think where people came from, and, and I think eth ethnicity was also important as well. You know, we're a country of immigrants, then and now we're a country of immigrants. And you, had, you had a lot of German Americans in the country at that time who they're rooting for Germany. It doesn't mean they were disloyal Americans, but if you walked up and said, who do you want to win this? Where they say Germany, we want the Kaiser to win. You have a lot of Irish people in the country who they sure don't like the United Kingdom and they're, they're kind of hoping that uh, Germany wins this as well. Uh, then you have many, many other Americans who are, you know, as I said, have some ties to the Allies in, in some shape or form. So it's it's a it's an interesting mix in the country, but I don't think there was ever a groundswell for sending troops to Europe. Um, I think there was sympathy for what was happening, and the Europeans themselves get annoyed with the United States during this time. They feel like we're getting rich on their misery because we're trading, we're, we're making millions of dollars shipping arms, particularly to the allies. Um, so we're making all this money, or, you know, our economy is going through the roof. And meanwhile, Europe is bleeding to death. So there was, there was that kind of antagonism towards us at the time in Europe that, you know, Americans are a bunch of shallow materialists. All they care about is getting rich. They don't care about honor, they don't care about anything. That was both sides said that about us. The Germans called us, I think, Dollarica instead of America, because it's all we care about is making a buck, making a dollar on this war. And you know, it's interesting, another contemporary issue which came about was, and this doesn't really matter, but it does matter in the sense of it really dominates the public debate. You know, a few, a few months ago, Tucker Carlson, on, on Fox was talking about like, why are we necessarily on the side of Ukraine? Like, why aren't we on the side of Russia? And that question I think is largely said in bad faith today, but I think it's an interesting question when it comes to the dynamic you're describing in the sense that, okay, so there are millions of Americans who are German Americans. There are millions of Americans who are Irish Americans. This is actually before Ireland is even, um, this, it's still technically the United Kingdom of, you know, Bali, 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 and Ireland. So not just like Northern Ireland. So Ireland is still very much um, um, colonized to a certain degree by, by the British. Why would, before, before the sinkings, before Germany really pushes things too far, why did we just align towards the British? I mean, famously at this time, like there would be, 
repeated incidents where, oh, maybe we go to war with Great Britain over this type of possession. Um, there's this infamous, um, we had a war plan for invading Canada if we had to. Why did we necessarily pivot towards the British in a way that really seems to define our relationship for the rest of the century? And, and the funny thing is, is that our connection with the British was not as strong as it was during World War II. You know, World War II, we had already had the special relationship with, 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 with the British. In World War I, the, the, there was a lot of annoyance with the, with, with the British before we actually got involved in the war ourselves, because the British are not killing us. They're not sinking ships on the high seas, but they're interfering with our trade. And this, this became a very touchy issue in the United States of the British. British basically said, well, you can't trade with some of these countries, some of these these neutral countries in Europe, because we know that some of that stuff is being reshipped to Germany. So we're going to start intercepting uh, American ships going over. We're going to check to see if there's any any um, any material on there, a contraband, and we're going to take it off. And we're going to eventually we'll 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 pay for it and send you the money. But we're going to basically interfere with legitimate American trade, which was a violation of international law. So this becomes a touchy issue with many Americans at the time. Uh, the British also decide we're going to start um, interfering with mails going across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so they start to censor mails. They start going through mails. And many Americans are concerned about this thing. I think they're trying to steal our trade secrets. So you, I, I've read some of the correspondence from the British side. There, there is this irritation with America saying, well, well, can't they just let this pass? This is bigger than a few dollars. And Americans, Wilson himself believed this, felt that, you know what, this is you know, international law should be true for both sides. If the British are not falling to the letter, we have to call them out up, out on it. Um, but for the Germans, they were frustrated in that they felt that the United States was never as hard on the allies with their abuses as they were hard on the, on the, uh, on the Germans. Now, Roosevelt at the time said, well, the difference is one is, one is money and one is lives. American lives are being lost because the Germans are sinking ships. Uh, we're losing money with the British sometimes, which is annoyance, but that's not quite, uh, that's on the same level. But as I said, there was more hostility towards the British than I, than I expected at this time. Uh, in this, there was no ever threat that we were ever gonna go to war with, with England, but there was some stuff in, in Wilson's letters where Wilson even says something to the effect like, you know, if the, you know, the British don't wanna listen to us, we're, I'm willing to go to war with them too. And when he was just blowing off steam, um, I don't know, but there there was a number of these little irritation um, irritations by the British towards Americans as far as American shipping. Uh, so, but I don't think there was ever going to be a rupture between the two because of the money we were making. We were making so much money trading with the British, and we were also loaning millions, if not billions, of dollars to them. By 1917, the entire British war effort is being almost supported by us. If we had pulled our money out, they, they would have probably had to stop fighting. So they're very dependent on us. We're dependent on them economically to a certain degree. So that's what the relationship is more all about. Not so much necessarily a love. I think later on, there was a much closer connection during World War II between the two sides, two, the two nations. I, I said this to you before the episode, but what I'm particularly interested in, especially from an audience perspective, is this idea that there are various points, especially in the 20th century, where the U.S. has to make a choice, quote unquote, about its role in the world. So the period we're talking about today, 1914 through 17, 1939 to 1941, World War II started, but we're not in it yet. 1945 to 47, the period between the end of World War II and the basic Iron Curtain speech. 1989, 1991, fall of the Soviet Union. And finally, you get to September 11th, the decision to go to war in Iraq. In all of these cases, starting with the one specifically that you've researched and studied, how much of this is actually up to America. Do you kind of get what I'm saying in the sense that you could say there was this debate, this clash over these three different models, intervention, neutrality, pacifism, but what really forced the issue was the Zimmerman telegram, obviously, which I'll let you explain in a second, but then also just the fact that the Germans were sinking American shipping when they were specifically told to stop doing so with their U-boats. So was, was, was this a clash that was ever going to get resolved with these debates and these speeches, or does it really take a outside force, a deus ex machina intervening to actually force a decision when we come to these various moments in history? I think unlike World War II, there was a way out in World War I for the United States. The United, uh, Wilson, even up until the last minute, could have said, no, we're not going to war. Uh, we're going to simply, we're going to arm our ships and we will, you know, we'll protect our shipping, but we're not sending troops over. 
Um, I think the country would have followed him. I, I really do. Um, there were issues that were pushing him towards war in early 1917, uh, but he, if he had really decided he didn't, it was not necessary, he could have avoided it. it the factors that were happening in early 1917 was that the Germans had decided basically, uh, we can't win a long war. Uh, we, have to, we have to wrap this up soon. Uh, they were hoping the United States would provide a path for them to, to begin peace talks with the allies get the war wrapped up with them leading with let them keep the territory uh, when that didn't happen and when wilson's own attempt at a peace peace move in late 1916 failed uh, the germans said okay well that's it we're going to unleash our submarines to their full potential because they had pulled back on them in 1916 to, to sort of placate the americans they hoped that if by unleashing the submarines they could cripple the British to such an extent that they would sue for peace by the end of 1917. As far as the Americans were concerned, they said, okay, well, the Americans will probably, they'll probably bring the Americans into the war, but by the time they get, get up and running, we'll have the war wrapped up. They'll never be able to get troops here in big enough numbers uh, by the time we have this war finished. So that was their strategy in early 1917. Uh, they told Wilson about that. Wilson at that point severed ties with the Germans, but even at that point, he still thought they might not follow through because in the past they had they had backed off when push came to shove. That was a factor that was pushing towards war. Uh, the Zimmerman telegram is another issue which you mentioned was, was, was a factor, but I think not as big a factor as people have been led to believe. The Zimmerman telegram was a, a crazy scheme from a, from a German foreign office of some in the foreign office said, let's, let's uh, send a telegram to the ambassador in Mexico offering them you know, if we get involved with war with America, if you go to war against them and sort of tie up American troops on the border, we'll give you the chance to reacquire territory that was taken from you years earlier, part of Arizona and New Mexico and things like that. It was a crazy scheme because if, if you know anything about Mexico in 1916, 17, they couldn't even govern themselves. The country was involved in the civil war. They were in no position to take territory away from the United States. Um, the idea that this even got out, of got out of Germany to Mexico shows you the, the, the state of things in the German foreign office at the time. Later on, many people in the German foreign office said this was the stupidest thing ever, and the person who, who created it should have been uh, basically drawn and quartered for the stupidity. The British intercepted that telegram, held on to it for a while. They actually didn't want the United States to know that they were reading messages in traffic across. Um, turned it over to Wilson. Wilson looked at it as um, uh, another thing. This is another factor. They decided to release it to the public, and that did get the public very worked up for a while. But I don't think that was really the reason why the United States went to war. I think ultimately it came down to Wilson deciding Wilson wanted to remake the post-war world. Wilson wanted to have a great impact on the situation in Europe, and he knew that we had to be involved in this war. Um, there's a scene in the book where Wilson talks to Jane Adams. Adams comes quick, to the quick, White House. Because I want to, I want to be very clear, clarify what you're saying. We had to be involved in order to shape that post exactly. war order. Okay, exactly, exactly. Um, Adams came to see him at this point when the war is about to, we're about to get involved, and tries to talk to him like, "Can't we find another way out of this?" And Wilson pretty much told her, "If we don't get involved, I'll be lucky to get into the peace treaty through a crack in the door." He told her that. So he, he had decided that I've got to be part of this, me, 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 Woodrow Wilson, because I have this view and America must be part of this. Uh, so I'm going to swallow my own distaste for war because Wilson didn't want to go to war. He wasn't a Roosevelt, he never really wanted to go. Uh, we have to go through with it. And then when there were a few ships, American ships sunk in March, that was the final provocation. And then Wilson said, okay, we're going forward. But even the vote in Congress, it was, it was I think it was 373 to 50 in the House of Representatives. Um, a lot of people said if it had been a secret ballot, it would have been a lot closer than that. You know, people didn't want to vote against war by that point because they knew there would be there would be political backlash. But a lot of congressmen, uh, you know, particularly from the South and, and parts of the Midwest, they really wanted, really didn't see the need for this war. They did not see that America's interests were threatened and that there were really national security issues. Uh, so it was it was hard to get the country behind the war initially until the whole propaganda machine gets up and running in a, in a while and, and people and Americans become super patriots and, and go way over in the other direction as far as uh, getting the nation worked up for the righteousness of this war that's going to end all wars and things like that. Yeah, what I really appreciate about your articulation of the Zimmerman telegram, I'd never thought about it this way, but it's so ridiculous on its face that it wasn't an actual threat. 
it's a, it's a, it's a rhetorical threat, but there was no, it's not as if we're shaking because we're going to lose California through New Mexico and parts of Texas. So that's actually, that's actually a useful context for, yeah, I actually never thought of, but that's, that's really helpful. So we'll get to the, we'll, we'll close out with the, with the post-war order, but I, I want to, because this is interesting. It's not usually helpful to ask who was right. Because in each of these cases, I think each figure was kind of onto something in a way that's useful. And history, the way it ended up playing out throughout the rest of the 20th century, seems to have vindicated different parts of their arguments. So just going down the line, what would you what would you say that Wilson, Roosevelt, and then Adams kind of when they're arguing these values-based positions in a world that's complicated, what, what, what do you think they were on to that people who are thinking about current issues like intervention in Ukraine should take away from? Well, before we get to that, I'll, I'll just make another quick point. There's another issue altogether, whether, whether it was a mistake for us to ever get involved in the war. Maybe we did more damage than, than, than we thought we were going to do. Um, there's a quote in the book from the German, German, uh, a diplomat, uh, Bernstorff. He was the German diplomat in Washington. And after the war was over, he said, you know, if America had stayed out, it's possible the two sides would have fought to a standstill. And if that had happened, it might have led to a, a more democratic Europe than what happened instead, which was Germany being crushed with America becoming involved in this war. And then that leads to the Treaty of Versailles, which of course leads to all kinds of problems, as we all know, in the next 20 years and eventually another world war. So whether America's uh, decision to get involved in this war was, was, was the right thing or the wrong thing is, is something that's also up for debate. Now, as far as the three individuals, I, th- I think they oh, all- Oh, and, and one, let's, ask a, let's, yeah. ask a, let's, ask a, let's ask a question, because here's another interesting question. You were saying democratic Europe. The big thing that's interesting about the Kaiser is this idea of, is Germany going to be this Prussian militaristic state? Is the Kaiser going to do essentially what his- British, you know, um, great, you know, British grandmother, Queen Victoria wanted, which is move things in a more constitutional direction where you have obviously um, a, a, demo- a constitutional monarchy. Would, a, would, would, do you think it's possible that the Kaiser could have stayed in power? Because it's not just a question of like, do the side settle? The question is, does the German horizontal and like monarchy fall? Like, what, what do you think about that? I question? mean, I, I'm admittedly not an expert on, on German history. I can only say with what I encountered in my own, my own research and, and what, what Bernstorff, who I just mentioned, uh, Bernstorff believed that German, the German army after fighting for four years and suffering so much uh, and exper- experiencing what they're experiencing, we're not going to be, able, we're not going to tolerate uh, a militaristic society when they returned home, that there was, there was going to be reforms, that the government was going to be reformed and if the Kaiser had not gone along with that, perhaps he would have been deposed or his, or his power stripped from him. I mean, this is all, who knows? I mean, it, but, but I, I think it's possible you might've seen a more liberal, liberal Germany after the war. I guess it would depend on the outcome of the war, outcome yeah. of, the, of, the, of, the, of the ceasefire or the, or, you know, it, it, the, the other scenario, of course, is possible that there's a ceasefire and then they, they basically start rearming and remilitarizing again. Uh, for another, another, which is um, what European uh, history is up until yeah. then, if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> what really would have been necessary would have been a League of Nations that the United States was involved in. You know, if, if that scenario had happened and, and the two sides had had made peace without either side defeating each other uh, decisively, it would have it would have taken a League of Nations to be fully in function and in power in the 1920s, uh, with America behind it and willing to to exert her might. Uh, to prevent, uh, you know, some kind of out- another future outbreak from occurring, but these are all 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 possibilities uh, that might have unfolded. Uh, but to come back to your other question about the three, I, I think they all and this may be a cop, but I think they all contributed something to the argument, had some some um, something right about their their perspective. I think Roosevelt, where he was much, I think, ahead of Wilson, was this idea that America must have a decent defense and military if we if we want to do anything around the globe. I mean, this idea that uh, America could make its might felt with a hundred thousand man army was 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 preposterous, and Wilson took a long time to get behind that. 
you know, early in the war, Wilson basically said, no, we're not going to expand the military. We'll, if we ever have to go to war, we'll find a way to get men. This is what we always do. Uh, but it took a while for him to, to come around to that. Now, Wilson, if, if he were here right now, would say, well, that's what the people wanted. The people in the United States didn't want militarism and would not tolerate a large defense buildup. And we can even push ahead to the 1950s. Americans were willing to take a giant defense buildup because of the fear of the fear of the Russians at the time. So if Americans feel there's a need for it, they'll tolerate it. But if they don't, they won't. Um, so I think Roosevelt was right in that case. Um, I think Jane Adams was right in trying to explore every avenue to peace. And perhaps Wilson should have worked faster on that. I mean, he, when he finally got around to trying something, it was late 1916. I think he waited too long. Uh, I think he was too willing to be to to do what the Allies wanted him to do. As far as well, the Allies like, okay, you can go for peace, but only after we have a battlefield advantage, only after we've just won a battle. Um, so Wilson, I think, waited too long. But I think Wilson was far far seeking, far seeing in his desire to build some sort of international community and build some sort of League of Nations that would be able to create collective security around the globe, with America playing an important role. So I think he was. Uh, quite significant in that regard and quite important in that regard. So, and we also have to consider the political realities of the time for Woodrow Wilson, you know, of, of, of what, what will the people accept at that time? You know, when he runs for president in 1916, right in the middle of all this, he had, you know, what gets him elected is this belief that he kept us out of war. He wins an extremely close election. If 2,000 votes or whatever flipped, he, he loses that election to the Republican Charles Evans Hughes. So the American people were not keen on war. They were not keen on defense necessarily. Um, it was a, he, he really had a many very, very difficult decisions to make. And again, I, I, so does President Biden today. It's the same thing. It's like, how do you placate your party? How do you placate American citizens? How do you placate the allies? And also when there's a human, human uh, uh, face to all this of the people of Ukraine suffering, you know, what do we do? How do we address this? So it really is a, a, an unbelievable burden that falls upon the president, any president in our history, when they're faced with these kinds of challenges. And it's just helpful because as we're closing out here, I'm just really thinking about the tensions and the arguments that are being made right now. So for example, it's possible, and I'm sure Theodore Roosevelt would argue, that it's not just about the U.S. having a big army so it could make its weight felt in the world, if the US has a bigger army, if its navy isn't smaller than Austria-Hungary's, maybe the Germans don't risk attacking American shipping. Maybe the US is treated more respectfully, not just on the negotiating table, but just in the sense of there is this sleeping giant in the North American continent, let's not mess with them. That would be an argument that Roosevelt can make. But then this is where it gets difficult into the Jane Addams point, which is, okay, well, historically, whenever there's been this army, you know, when you have a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail, and it's very easy to say we're going to build. And this is what this is this recurring debate in the 20th century, which is, can we fund a military that's powerful and not overreach with it? And is it, that's that's that, that's and then and then finally on the on the on the Wilson end, which is where we should really end. I'm really obsessed with this question, and this is basically what this series this month is focused on, which is, it's clear that a certain post Cold War order has collapsed um, in, in recent weeks. Something is going to come next. How should America think about trying to recon reconstruct new orders when, through the example of Wilson, we really see when hubris and megalomania, but also an inability to even follow through on that idea becomes a problem. So well, what should we learn from Wilson's, because this, this is the other part that hasn't aged well from Wilson. Um, just in the sense of like Wilsonianism, people don't usually use this in a positive, in a positive phrasing. So yeah, what's this close with Wilson and his efforts, successful or otherwise, to build a new order after the war? I think Wilson overreached after World War One. I. I think that was probably his 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 greatest failing. I think, and that applies to us in the 21st century. I think we have to keep our 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 goals realistic. Uh, and, and learn from some of the mistakes that he made over a hundred years ago, as far as that was concerned. Um, I also think we have to be, be aware of the threats that are gonna be facing us in the next five, 10, 15 years. I don't think we were obviously, I don't think anyone saw this coming, what was happening right here. So I think that preparation is also very important. I think Wilson certainly learned that the hard way that he was, the country was not prepared, the country was not ready. Uh, and I think he was a little bit naive in some of it, in some of that regard. So I think 
obviously the current administration has, has learned quite a few lessons in, in the last couple of weeks, then they're going to learn more lessons in the future as far as what we're going to be facing. As you said, we're going to be facing an entirely new world order, and we're going to have to work closely with our allies to make sure something like this doesn't happen again and make sure that our own national security is not threatened again. Wilson obviously tried to do that at Versailles as much as he could, uh, but you know his great centerpiece of all this was the League of Nations, which he did get through, but America was not involved in it and did not join the League of Nations. So he was really unable to accomplish what he needed to, what was needed to accomplish to prevent another global war a few years down the line. So I think that's probably the biggest lesson that needs to be learned is we have to develop some sort of a mechanism uh, in, in concert with our allies to prevent something from like this from happening in the future and to figure out viable ways to prevent this from happening in the future. No, and that's a helpful note because if you think about it, another lesson from Wilson is there has to be some degree of democratic, small d democratic buy-in to your vision if you're an American president and what Roosevelt and Truman are much more successful at 30 years later is building it's not as if there was a vote. Um, there wasn't a popular vote uh, in favor of the containment policy, but it was a policy that was sustainable across both parties for over 45, almost 50 years. And that's an example of what proper politics was like. The actual final question here is something I'm, no one's really written this piece yet, so I'm very curious about this. I've seen, since Russia invaded Ukraine, I've seen progressives really just absent from a lot of the debate moving forward, just because I think a lot of folks on, on the left were very much in the camp of Putin won't do this. The US is defined by our mistakes in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, AOC, um, when asked by um, Mehdi Hassan about this, talked about you know the defense industry and the military industrial complex and contractors, which is a thing, but that's a different question than what do we do if Putin actually invades? So how do you just, if you're looking at the progressive movement today, a left, which is very much up for debate, especially given the fact that Joe Biden is a, is a, is a figure who is going to be succeeded by something different. How does that play out? Do you, do you have any thoughts on how that's playing out today? Well, it does remind me of, of the 1900s progressives that many of them were, their, their concern was domestic issues and they were less comfortable weighing in on foreign, foreign affairs. They were, they were not comfortable with the military. The, 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 many of the progressives of the early 19th, of the early 20th century, and I think that's true with today's left. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't wanna really have to discuss military matters or defense issues. And I mean, they see that, as you mentioned, AOC's comment on, on, on contractors and things like that. As as representing as something uh, antithetical to the to the left's view and the left's vision, so I think they have to come up with their own vision uh, for this uh, this war and what America's role is in this war. Um, I think progressives did come to that vision a hundred something years ago. As far as you know, as far as the good things we've done in the United States as a reform movement, we have to do these good things around the globe in remaking Europe. So so maybe some of that can be can be uh, dispersed in the current message of the left as far as the the war in ukraine well neil this has been really great i'd love for you to just to shout out the book and you also have a bunch of baseball things in the background i know you've written about but so just shout out any anything you've written about um in the past well in the past i've done work on the negro baseball leagues i wrote a couple of books on that uh, one of them was called negro league baseball which was the story of the business of the negro leagues and then i wrote a biography of roy campanella who played the Negro Leagues and later became part of the first group to integrate the major leagues along with Jackie Robinson. So that was the last book I did. And then I've moved away from sports and did this new book on uh, World War I. Um, but hopefully um, people will seek it out. I think the book has a little something for everything. It's not just uh, foreign affairs and politics, but there's a lot of stuff just about American life uh, in, at the time of World War I. You know, it's a very exciting time with new technology and some of the challenges they face, we face today. They face polio, we face COVID. So uh, there's a lot more parallels than you might think of between the 19 teens and the, and the 2020s uh, of today. The book is The Approaching Storm. Neil, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. Thank you very much for having me.